I wonder how well you know uh, different countries' national animals. I mean, we won't go with Australia and New Zealand, it's too obvious, right? Australia's national animals, kangaroo, emu. New Zealand is what? Kiwi, of course. Okay, let me uh, see how well you know these ones. We'll start with some easy ones. There's the eagle, the rooster, and the bulldog. Anyone know eagle? What country? USA. USA. Rooster? France. France. And bulldog? Britain. Britain. Okay, two, three easy ones. I'll give you slightly harder ones. The Komodo dragon, the elephant, and the tiger. Komodo dragon. Indonesia, very good. Uh, the elephant. Thailand, the Asian elephant, of course, and then the tiger. It's actually a couple of countries, but India is one of them. Okay, now why, why, these, why these ones for the, for the countries? The eagle, your bulldog, your Komodo dragon. Um, obviously, they're pretty cool animals to represent a country. They represent, highlight the nation in some unique way. But then you get some really odd ones. I'll show you a couple of kind of odd ones. You kind of think, why did these countries pick these ones as their national animals? So you've got here the beaver and the dugong. Anyone know which country has the beaver as their national animal? It's Canada. The dugong, any ideas? It's a bit harder. It's actually Papua New Guinea. So you're thinking, these really cute animals, okay? They're not tough and strong. They don't fly like eagles. In fact, what they're known for, for Canada and for PNG, is they've been hunted. This is the reason why these animals were chosen. In the history of Canada, in the history of PNG, beavers and dugongs were hunted and became vital in their growth as countries because of the fur and the meat it provided. That's why they chose these animals, not because they're strong and tough or even because they're cute and cuddly, but because they were killed. Really strange choices. Well, what did God choose to put his great plan of salvation on show? Did he choose the saints and heroes of the faith, martyrs and missionaries? Did he choose great events like the miracles of the Bible, the parting of the Red Sea, even the resurrection of Jesus? Are those things what God puts on show, his great plan of salvation? Well, not really, because did you notice verse 10 that we read out earlier? It says there that his intent was now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Are you surprised? Because you should be. Because when you read the church here, don't think of the big and showy things. Don't think of the cathedrals in Europe. Don't think of the mega churches in the US or the big rallies or the popes. And the, don't think that. The church in the first century when Paul wrote this, it's just gatherings of ragtag, mostly poor and very persecuted people meeting in homes. Even the church today, looking past all their fancy stuff, is really a group of people with pretty offensive beliefs who, at least in the West, are shrinking in numbers and really are very flawed, sinful people. That's the church. The church is the beaver and the dugong. Why should God choose to use the church to display his wisdom to all of the powers in heaven? Such an odd choice. Well, that's precisely what he does. Now, because this is true, because the church is the display of the master's master plan, we ask ourselves at SWEC, what kind of community do we need to build in our church, in our local church? Well, of course, we need to then build a community that also displays the master's plan. So we're going to pray and look at what that means for us in our second DNA talk. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you've brought us here as a church even separated, some of us here physically, some of us online, during in the midst of COVID, it really feels weak. It feels little. It feels like we're the beavers and the dugongs. And yet you've chosen the church to display your wisdom and power. Help us to know what that means for us as a part of the universal church, but also help us what it, to know what it means and what, how it applies to us as one body here at SWEC in Sydney Southwest. In Jesus' name, amen. So a few points. Let's um, firstly look at the church, okay? Um, and no New Testament book, of course, highlights the church in God's master plan, quite like the book of Ephesians. Now, why is the church, you know, the dugong and the beaver, why is it 
God's choice to show off his wisdom? Well, you'll see it once you look at the before and after. So let's firstly have a look at the before. Um, Ephesians chapter 3 actually follows from Ephesians 2, which we didn't read. But let me show you a few verses at the end of Ephesians 2. There he says, Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, Remember, at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship of Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. Okay, before Jesus, the world is divided into two. You were either a Jew or a Gentile. Gentile just means non-Jew. And this division affected both vertical and horizontal relationships. Vertical between you and God, horizontal between you and each other. So notice that for Gentiles, non-Jews, you were excluded, right? You were without hope, without God, it says there. And consequently, because you were without hope and without God, you were excluded and outsiders to the Jews. Now, this last week, we've had a bit of a saga, haven't we, with Novak Djokovic, and uh, whether he's in, whether he's out. In the end, obviously, he got kicked out. And whether you agree with that or not, do you remember what our prime minister said? Right? Scott Morrison said, basically, Novak is not an Australian citizen, nor is he even an Australian resident. So there are no special exemptions that should apply to him. Right? Couldn't be Starker, could it? He was treated as an outsider. He is an outsider, according to the PM. He's a Gentile in relation to us insiders. Yeah? That's what it's like. But for the Jews of Paul's day, it was even more harsh. Um, Let me read to you a quote from a historian. He said this, The Jew had an immense contempt, contempt just means hatred and anger, for the Gentiles. The Gentiles said the Jews were created by God to be fuel for the fires of hell. God, they said, loves only Israel of all the nations he has made. It was not even lawful to render help to a Gentile mother in her hour of sorest need, For that is simply to bring another Gentile into the world. Until Christ came, the Gentiles were an object of contempt to the Jews. The barrier between them was absolute. If a Jewish boy married a Gentile girl or if a Jewish girl married a Gentile boy, the funeral of that Jewish boy or girl was carried out. Can you imagine your parents doing that? Such contact with a Gentile was the equivalent of death. This was architecturally also the case with the Jewish temple. Right? There was on the outside an outer court only for the Gentiles, or sorry, that, only gen, that Gentiles could only come in. And, and by the way, they discovered um, a sign, an archaeological discovery of a sign. And this is, sorry, you won't be able to read that, of course, because it's in another language. But this is what the sign said. It was put on the, 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 the kind of rails between the outer court and the other courts that only Jews could go into. The sign says this, No stranger is to enter within the rails around the temple and enclosure. Whoever is caught will be himself responsible for his ensuing death. Okay? That was the temple. If you're a Gentile, you could go here, but no further. But all of that is, of course, symbolic, right? As Paul said, without hope, without God, and without relationship with God's special people. Or in the language of Ephesians chapter 2, the earlier verses, which we won't read, but are very, maybe more familiar, it says, remember that you were dead in your transgressions and sins. You were dead. And by you, he actually means Gentiles. You were dead, dead to God, dead to God's chosen people. And by the way, you know, as as we read this, I know this is not us now, but this was us. Almost every single member of SWEC, with the possible exception of just one person who has a Jewish heritage that I know of, every other person in SWEC is born a Gentile. This was us. Without hope, without God, without relationship with God's special chosen people. Until, of course, Jesus came. You see, Ephesians 2 is famous for a really big but, all right? You were dead, but now in Christ, you're raised to life. You're made alive. And it's that famous chapter of you're you're being saved, right, by grace, God's generosity, free gift, through faith, through trusting in Jesus, right, that famous chapter. Well, what's applied individually in those first verses of chapter 2 of Ephesians will now be applied to all Gentiles, As a whole, because in chapter 2, verse 13, there is also a big but. 
Right? Remember, without hope, without God in the world, but, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. How does Jesus' blood do that? Well, it's because through Jesus' blood, a new access point to God has been established. See, before you had to become a Jew. You had to, ouch, get circumcised. You had to obey the entire Old Testament law with its 623 laws to stay in God's favor. That was the access point. You had to become a Jew first. Jesus changed all that because Jesus was the perfect Jew. He was the perfect law keeper for our sake. He did it for us so that we wouldn't have to. And what his blood is, is his sacrificial death. That's what the blood means there. Shorthand for Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross. Because on the cross, what happened? Our sins and our failures, our Gentileness was put on him. And on the cross, his perfection becomes ours through faith even his perfect Jewishness. Now, before we go further, just a reminder, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, or if you're not sure, this is great news for you. This is the essence of the good news of Jesus. No matter who you are, whether you've had a church background or not, you can become God's own people because of Jesus. What he did for you on the cross, dying for your sins instead of you, and giving you his perfect track record, trust in Jesus. It could all be yours. If you don't know how to do that, come and see me afterwards. But again, February is a great month to find out more in Invitation Month. Okay. Um, now, the focus of, uh, just back to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 and onwards, is not so much on that vertical, as important as that is, like us and God. We talked about that. But it's actually, the focus is actually moving to talk about the horizontal, the relationship between us and each other, and especially between Gentiles and Jews, because here... Now, because we can access God equally, we can all, Gentiles and Jew, become his people. And so you see there in verse 14, For he, Jesus himself, is our peace, who has made the two groups, that's Jew and Gentile, one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Now, we talked about the hostility before, right? If you marry a Jewish boy or girl, it's basically like your funeral. I mean, a Gentile boy or girl is basically like your funeral. That, that was a hostility. Well, that's now destroyed. In verse 18, for through him, we both have access to the Father by the one Spirit. Now, I don't know if you know the uh, famous photos of 1914 Christmas. This was uh, the first year of World War I. What happened when Christmas Day came around, uh, the Germans came out of their trenches into that bit in the middle where there's all this kind of barbed wire. It's called no man's land because you go there, you're going to die, right? So you've got Germans on one side, you've got the Allies on the other side. The Germans came out of their trenches into no man's land, and then the, the, the Allies also came out. It's Christmas Day, and they began to shake hands and shared cigarettes, and they played soccer together. It was called the famous Christmas truce of 1914, which was shocking, right, and unimaginable. Like these, these groups of people that were blowing each other's heads off coming together, on Christmas Day. Such a pity it didn't continue, of course, because the day after they went back and blew each other's heads off for the next four years, all right? Well, the gospel brought about a real truce, but one that would last. And it was even more unexpected and even more shocking. In fact, it was so unexpected that Paul says, this was my life's mission that God gave me out of special revelation. God had to reveal it to him because as a Jew, as a Pharisee, there was no way he could have guessed that this was God's plan all along. And so it became his life mission to tell people what God has now revealed. And he uses the word mystery. All right, and we might have read that before in Ephesians 3, the mystery that God entrusted to him, the administration of this mystery. Mystery here just means secret. A secret that was once hidden, but now God has revealed. And what is the mystery? What is the secret? This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel. That would have been so shocking for a Jew to hear. What these Gentile dogs only fit for the fires of hell are going to inherit the earth with us Jews? Yes. Members together of one body and share us together in the promise of Christ Jesus. And so Paul spent his life to talk about that, reveal that in his mission work to Gentiles. 
bringing them into the kingdom of God. Because every time a Gentile is brought to Jesus, he or she is also brought into the new people of God. And through this new people of God, consisting of both Jew and Gentile, i.e. the church, now you see how God's master plan and his wisdom is on cosmic display. His intent was that now through the church, this Gentile and Jew, one body, newly formed church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. All the powers in heaven, angels and demons gasped. They were like, oh, we could not have guessed that. Shock. Wow according to the eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is God's master plan. And that's why we as a church community, we are on display. And we need to display something of God's master plan. Right? If Jew and Gentile are united as one body, then any groups of people, no matter how different they are or used to be, can be united See, there is a radical reconciliation on a human race scale, Jew and Gentile, and that needs to be evident in church community. So let me ask you, even within SWEC, even among the body of Christ here, your brothers and sisters in Christ, is there someone that you are out of relationship with because of conflict? And what are you going to do about it? No, it's hard. Right? Healing of hurts is not easy. You might need someone to come along and be a bit of a mediator. But can you see how important it is that within this local body of Christ, just one drop in the ocean, there needs to be a display, a living out of the radical reconciliation that God has brought about in the whole of human history. So if you are out of relationship, if there's hurts, unresolved things, don't just up and leave church. Now, that's not healthy. It's not good for you. And believe me, you will take your baggage to the next church. Sort it out. With help if you need. Prayerfully, sort it out today. All right? What about our church? Well, firstly, let's talk about the communities out there because our church has always had, since we started in 2009, hasn't changed when we planted Bankstown. In fact, it's why we planted Bankstown, um, why we want to start an 11 o'clock Mandarin. We have a particular calling. Our church's particular calling, and I'll speak about this more next week, is to reach other migrants, migrant communities in this region of Sydney, in Sydney Southwest. And so let's just talk a little bit about Canterbury-Bankstown, this LGA that we're in. The largest, most populous LGA, local government area, and the most ethnically diverse in Sydney. What is our community like? And by the way, this is the least reached community in Sydney. Well, amongst our community out there, there are three big migrant communities, right? No prizes for guessing who they are, the Chinese, the Vietnamese, and the Lebanese. But what are these communities like? Are they all nice and blended amongst with our Anglo friends? And no, no, they're not. They exist in pretty separate pockets, don't they? If you go to Bankstown, it's very obvious. One side of Bankstown is Vietnamese, the other side is Lebanese, and never the two shall meet. Right? See, our communities out there, diverse, but not united. Right? That's what it's like. And migrant communities especially, for good reason. Language barriers, cultural barriers, all these sort of reasons. It's not the blended Australian thing that people are looking for. It's not even like what they try to do in America. All right? These cultures, these communities, migrant communities exist pretty separately. So by bringing the gospel, the good news of Jesus, to the Southwest, what do we have? We have an opportunity, don't we, to see God create something new and beautiful. That's our calling as a church, that we can see people in all of these different migrant communities restored vertically in their relationship with God. Buddhists and Muslims and atheists coming to Christ. Wouldn't that be amazing? Vertical, but then also horizontal. People from these migrant communities brought into relationship with each other, where previously they might not have ever had, which brings us to our community in here. And this is what it means for us and 
the fuller expression of our second DNA strand is this. We want to, as a church, build a multi-generational and a multicultural gospel community. That's what we're aiming for. That's what we've got to do in light of what we've talked about. Now, let me explain some of these terms. Why multi-generational? Well, it's because, guess what? Migrant communities are very strongly based around what? Families, right? In Anglo-Australian culture, not so much so because no one can afford to, but you know, it used to be the case, you're 18, you move out of home, you're your own person. In, a- in Asian and other migrant, including uh, Middle Eastern families, you stay around. And the reason why COVID tends to spread really rapidly in migrant communities, because when we talk about family and you have a wedding or a celebration, it's cousins, uncles, aunties, everyone, it's huge, right? It's multi-generational, often living in the same house or close to each other. That's what the communities are like. And so our church has got to reflect that, multi-generational. Now, why did I say multicultural and not multi-ethnic? It's the reason why. Did you know that even amongst the same ethnicity, there are different cultures within? See, ethnicity becomes too broad of a category. Like amongst Chinese, for example, even Han Chinese, just one segment. You've got people from Beijing and Shanghai and all the different cities in China. But then you've also got people from Taiwan and Singapore and Malaysia, Indonesia. You've got also people, even Chinese people growing up in places like Fiji and Mauritius. Every single one is a different culture, do you see, amongst the same ethnicity. And so we want to see a multiculturalism. Like, don't look around and think, oh, everyone's basically Asian and Chinese. There's only one culture. No, there isn't. There are lots of cultures here. And especially when you take into account all of the other services at Sweck, Mandarin, Bankstown. So many different cultures. And even across generations, there are different cultures. Overseas born is one particular culture. Australian born, Australian raised. First, second, third generation, they're all different cultures. Socioeconomic, where you live, your education, your professions, all different cultures within the same ethnicity. But we want to be a church that represents the diversity of cultures, even over and above ethnicity. Now, okay, that, you see that multicultural, multigenerational. What does this mean for us as a church? Number one, we've got to take steps, don't we? towards greater generational and cultural diversity. And we have a long way to go. Like, this is an ideal we want to, God willing, be heading for, but we have a long way to go. But I want to tell you there's, you know, some really important developments, one in particular that you guys at Kingsgrove won't have heard about. And that is, um, we're going to um, be asking the congregation at Bankstown to consider, and they'll vote on it, so it's up to, ultimately up to them. But... Um, Starting in term two, potentially, just after Easter, the Bankstown congregation is going to move from 4 p.m. to 10 a.m. And not just that, it's not just a time slot move, but there's a proposal and an eagerness for us to partner with the Anglican congregation, currently at 10 a.m., St. Paul's Anglican. And we're not becoming one church, but we're going to put on a united service together at 10 a.m. every Sunday. And if it works out, we'll trial it for six months, then we'll keep going. Now, that's what's happening. We're moving to the morning. We're combining with a church that's predominantly Anglo with a few other ethnicities and cultures, right? But why are we doing that? Why couldn't we have just, we could have just moved into the morning without them. We didn't have to consider this partnership, but we're considering the partnership and really giving it a go because why? Because of this. Because it could diversify us as a church generationally and culturally. And so we're going to give it a shot. It's not easy right? There's going to be a lot of obstacles, but we're really excited to give it a try for this reason. So that's the first, and you should be prayerful and excited about that, right? We're going to take steps towards that. But the second thing is, even without looking outside and all the things that we could be doing that we're not yet doing, I want to challenge us, especially here, to embrace unity and diversity where we are already in the generations and the languages and the cultures that already exist at SWEC. Yes, it's important to keep thinking outwards, but let's think about here, because there are already lots of diversities, aren't there? Like background, even hobbies and interests and personalities, that on top of the ethnic and the div- language and the cultures. And so we're trying something at Kings Grove at 11. We're going to try to take steps to mixing some of our community groups, to mix some of the age groups. 
That's not going to be easy. No, is that going to involve sacrifice? Yes. But do you see why it's important that we give it a try? That we don't just stick to the people that we're comfortable with? That we actually think about multi-generational, multicultural relationships? It's not going to be easy, but I hope you see why we're doing it. And I hope you can support it, especially if you feel like you're the ones that maybe are missing out on some of the friendships you had in your old CGs. And it's for that reason also that we, you know, a little while ago, we decided we'd start an 11 o'clock Mandarin, which is on hiatus at the moment because a lot of the families aren't coming in person and we're not live streaming that, but we will get it going again, definitely. And combining our kids' ministry at 11 o'clock so that, that the Mandarin families and the English families can have kids' ministry together. That also allows us potentially to, to have more relationship with Mandarin speakers at 11 o'clock because it's in the same time slot. Maybe in the future we'll share morning tea together. We'll do some things together. Like, is that going to be easy across language groups, across different cultures and backgrounds? Of course not. But is it worth doing? Yes. Because what we're doing is embracing the diversity that already exists amongst the Swek family. You see, one really important thing is don't be grudge the difficulties that will come with that. Like trying to do life together, trying to do community, being a church that is already diverse, it's supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be hard. Don't begrudge it. This is what church is supposed to be like. All right? Not just people that you normally would have hung out with, that you naturally gravitate towards. That's not church. That's everything else in the world. Church is supposed to be different. I was talking to an older couple from Bankstown about this moving to the morning and partnering with St. Paul's, and I was kind of being really, really sensitive and wanting to say, you know, it's ultimately, you know, like it's not going to suit everyone and blah, blah, blah. And you know what they said to me? They said, and by the way, they don't live anywhere near Bankstown. They said to me, they said, for us, it's not about convenience. We don't do church for convenience, they said. It's about mission, right? What's going to help grow the gospel and grow our people? If the answer is this, moving to the morning, joining up with St. Paul's to put on a service. If the answer is yes, then we're, we're, we're for it. Do, do you see? That's the right attitude to have. It's not about convenience. Do I want to move community groups? If you've been part of a good community group, probably no. But it's not about my convenience. It's not about my preference. What is good for the gospel? If the answer is yes, if the answer is a church and community groups that more reflect the diversity and the unity in diversity of the gospel, then it's got to be yes, right? I can put aside my own preferences. I can put aside my own conveniences. And I'll do my very best to make it work for the gospel. And you might be surprised, you might really love it. So three things, your role. Number one, embrace community. Pursuing community is scary, isn't it? Because it leaves us vulnerable. Like you can't really do life with someone unless you're willing to open up. Relating to Christians can be much harder than relating to non-Christians because of the level of vulnerability that it involves. But it's Sanctifying. It makes you more like Jesus because you have to live out the gospel to put up with each other. So let me encourage you to embrace community. Get involved. If you're not part of a community group, see Stephen Coe. He would love to see you. Sundays, get involved. Fellowship meals when we have them again, but even if we go to the park afterwards, get involved. Now, COVID has happened. We understand that COVID has made us a lot more scared about these things, and we get that. But if you've found yourself over the last two years to have withdrawn, and yes, there's a lot of people you've withdrawn, okay, maybe now's the time to think, if I've withdrawn, and by the way, withdrawing is not just a physical thing, right? It's, it's, it's whether you've checked out mentally, relationally. Don't use COVID as an excuse anymore. I'm not saying go out there and, you know, be dangerous and get infected. No, no. You may still decide to live stream from home. I'm not saying that you can't. But don't use COVID as an excuse to withdraw relationally. Because guess what? You can pursue community even in spite of COVID, can't you? There are other ways of pursuing community, other ways to keep in touch. Stop withdrawing if you've been doing that 
for the last year and a half, two years. Connect again in a COVID safe way, but it's going to take effort. However, so having said that, maybe you've tried that. Maybe you've tried community even before COVID. And at SWEC, hey, let's admit it, not everyone's going to find it easy. And maybe you've been discouraged because you still don't feel that connected. Well, the next point, embrace outsiders. I'm talking to the insiders now. Now, I don't know if you know about this um, pretty famous thing that happened um, in news last year, an art student in, from China who disguised herself as a wealthy socialite and carried a fake Hermes bag was able to stay in Beijing for three weeks without spending a single penny. Uh, Zhou Yachi, 23, conducted an experiment as a part of a performance art project where she wanted to highlight capitalism and consumerism and see if she'd be able to live in the Chinese capital once she graduated from university. The student who attends the Central Academy of Fine Arts of Beijing shared that she is poor, but she wanted to break the rules and enter the world of the rich as a Mingyuan, which means socialite in Mandarin. It's what she did. But all it did was highlight that there's this huge divide in China, even more so than out here, between the wealthy and everyone else, okay? These socialites and everyone else. And for her, she managed to break in, but she had to fake it to make it, yeah? What's, of course, tragic is that in many church communities, including ours, some people will find it so hard to feel welcomed and embraced. And you see, if, here, if in here we have to fake it to make it, That's a real tragedy because it would show none of the glories of the gospel that Jesus died to bring. Now, our community will never be perfect, but it should pain us when someone is discouraged or hurt because they've tried to embrace community but haven't been able to really find it. So guess what? It's up to those who have found it to embrace them. That's the logic of the gospel, right? The strong Sacrifice for the weak, the connected, look out for the disconnected. So if you are a regular at SWEC and you feel pretty much connected, see it as your special role, yeah, to welcome and build bridges for newcomers and outsiders. One way you can do about uh, a couple of tips that I've received from different churches or different people. Um, One church has a policy, especially amongst their welcoming team, but really should be for anyone, Right? The policy is this. A person who is on their own at church is an emergency. Right? Anytime you see a person kind of sitting, standing, dawdling on their own, that's an emergency. See it as your job to befriend them, to talk to them. I mean, they might be there for other reasons. It, might be, it doesn't matter. Just make it a policy. Person on their own at church is an emergency. Another one really helpful tip is I remember at my old church, the one I grew up in, um, where, where the CGs were really, really tight and really, really connected, um, was a couple of CG leaders said to their, their, their community groups, hey, look, you know what? The time straight after church finishes is not for us to catch up with each other as much as we love hanging out with each other. The time straight after right, is not for us to catch up with each other or friends that we already know. There's time for that. That's for when everyone else is gone. Because guess what? If you're a newcomer or you're an outsider, you generally will leave as soon as, as, soon as you can, which is you're not going to hang around for that much longer. So that time, just straight after church, if all the people who know each other catch up with each other, then no one's going to welcome. Do you see what I mean? And so they've decided as a CG, as a whole group, every single week, we will it's kind of funny when you see it happening because you see them deliberately walking past each other, right? These are like best buddies in CG. And straight after church finishes, they're like, I don't even know you. And what are they doing? They're, they're all heading towards the newcomer and the outsider. I mean, that's a great thing for a whole CG to try. Maybe at the beginning of the year, you, your whole CG can try, especially if you're one of the CGs that really do feel connected, okay? We don't talk to each other. That, time for that later. We can do that at the park, at the pub, you know? Straight after church is a time for us to find other people. There you go, there are a couple of suggestions to embrace the outsider. Last of all, embracing diversity. Right? We aim to be more generationally and culturally diverse. But as I said, we can start by already embracing the diversity that we have. And I talked about it a little bit before, about mixing CGs and stuff. But on an individual level, this is what you can do. How about this? Make it your aim in 2022 to just find one person. Just find one person at SWEC, in your congregation, that you have very little in common with, okay? In fact, if it wasn't for the fact that you're in the same church, you would probably 
never have come across someone like them. Because age-wise, ethnicity-wise, culturally, hobbies, and this is nothing you have in common with them, except that you belong to the same church family and you call them brother or sister. Find that person and then make it your goal in 2022 to intentionally know them. That's it. Simple, right? Even better, maybe form a prayer partnership with them or, or a prayer triplet with a couple of them. Right? Prayer triplets are so important, really can build relationship and build growth. Now, if you're wanting to be part of a prayer triplet this year, especially if you're trying to do this deliberately with people that you don't know as well, it'd be a great thing to do. Um, why don't you see Stephen Coe or, or Becky? Um, is that right, Becky? I'm just going to nominate you. Um, and say, I want to be in a triplet this year. Here are some ideas of people I'd like to be with. I'm sure we'd be able to work that out. Okay. Will all of this be hard? Yes, it will. Will it be worth it? Yes, it will. See, as long as the church community in here is just like the world out there, God receives very little glory. The gospel doesn't look that good. Remember, because the church is God's wisdom and his master plan on display. But when the church community is like this, then it can really impact the world. And we'll look at that next week as we look at our third DNA, which is on mission. Let's get the band up. We'll get ready to sing. Let's pray.